what I see is that everyone's talking about all these things, but no one's talking about what matters most. Everyone's talking about security and politics and Biden administration and the State Department and UNRWA and all of this stuff that's around the main issue. And what is the main issue? It's the littlest of all words, but it's the word that means everything. And we're talking about God. We have to bring God into the conversation about what's happening in Israel. And more than just talking about God, we need to understand what's at the crux of this war. What's actually at the heart of Israel? What is this process of Shivat Zion, of this return of the Jewish people to Zion? What is this actually all about? And so the way to really like bring it to light is to go deep into a Bible study. And so first, I would absolutely encourage everyone that's here live, that's listening to this later, to take notes, bring out your Tanakh, mark it in your Tanakh so you can reference it later. This, in my opinion, is the axis upon which everything spins in the entire world. And so let's open up to Ezekiel chapter 36. Start with verse 17 through 19. And here's what it says. Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own ways and deeds. Therefore, I poured out my fury on them for the blood they had shed on the land and for the idols with which they had defiled it. So I scattered them among the nations and they were dispersed throughout the countries. I judged them according to their ways and their deeds. And so, so many people, when the Jewish people were in exile, they said, okay, the Jews are gone. They're lost. God has forsaken them for whatever theological reason that they had. They're just a cursed people because look at them. They're scattered around the world. They're persecuted. They're being judged by God. Obviously, God has left them for someone else or God doesn't exist at all. But the Jews, they're done. It's over for them. And that really was the story. There are consequences. There's a covenantal relationship that we have with God that if we don't act according to his ways in the Holy Land, the Holy Land cannot handle unholiness, and it will spit us out. And that is the last 2,000 years of Jewish existence. Now, there's another promise in the Bible. It says that the Jewish people will always remain. An eternal covenant is an eternal covenant. But the last thing you would want to do to an eternal people is scatter them around the world with no common culture, no common language, no phones, no faxes, no internet, no way to communicate with each other. It's like you want to erase a people from the world bring them out of their land, scatter them across the world, and in a few generations, they'll be gone, as are every single one of the ancient peoples of the Bible. The Jews, we are the only ancient people alive today. So God made an eternal covenant at that time. All of the peoples of the Bible are lost. Think about that. It's really remarkable. The Canaanites, the Moabites, the Jebusites, the Babylonians, the Persians, the I mean, even the Egyptians, they're not the Egyptians of old. They're pharaohs with different gods and different people. Arabs now live in Egypt, and they're not the Egyptians of old. All of the ancient peoples and all their civilizations are all gone, but the Jews were promised they're going to be scattered around the world, but they're going to be eternal. And then what happens? Let's go to the next verses in Ezekiel. 36, verse 20s and 22. When they come to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said of them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they have gone out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations, wherever they went. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. So now this is stage two. A time is going to come in history where God sees that the scattering of the people of Israel is in Hebrew, a chilul Hashem, a profanes God's name. Now that's a really, that's a, that's not a good word in English. What does the word profane really mean? Chilul Hashem is the word in Hebrew. What does the word Chilul Hashem mean? Halal means empty. So what is the Chilul Hashem? It is an emptying of God from the world. Because the nations look at Israel and they're like, that's the chosen people? That's God's chosen people? Well, that doesn't look like a chosen people. Their God is either 
very weak or their God doesn't exist. And it emptied God's name from the world. And that was a Chilul Hashem. And God said, I created this entire universe and I don't do this right now for you, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake. That God ultimately created this entire world for the ultimate revelation. And right now, Israel in the exile is a desecration of God's name. It empties him from the world. When you think about the Nazis in the last generation, it wasn't just that the Nazis were throwing us into gas chambers, but it was as they were kicking us in that they would say, where's your God, Jews? Where's your God now? If he's so strong, why doesn't he save you? And then God said, a time is going to come. The Nazis will be gone and Israel will be back in their land. And that will be the ultimate sanctification of God's name. So let's continue. Ezekiel 36, verses 23 to 25. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. So God is now going to sanctify his name. He's going to bring his presence back into the world. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord says the Lord God, when I am sanctified in your uh, in, in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. So now let's set up this thing so we can actually understand what is happening in Israel. God chose a singular family, one people that came out of Jacob, Bnei Yisrael, the children of Israel. And he said, I'm going to put my name, the children of Israel, I am the God of Israel. And I'm going to give them the land of Israel. And the living testimony of God's truth, of God's sovereignty, will be expressed when against all odds, the people of Israel return to the land of Israel. And that will be a Kiddush Hashem. That will be a sanctification of God's name. That will be filling the world with a God consciousness because how did all these prophecies possibly come true while the Jews are living in Israel? You can't deny it. So then now let's look. Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 33 and to 36. So thus says the Lord God, on that day I will cleanse you from all your contaminations and I will enable you to dwell in the cities and the ruins shall be rebuilt and the desolate land shall be tilled. And instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by, so they will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. And the wasted, desolate, and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations which are left all around, you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. That's what this is all about. That's why when people come to the Arugot farm and they see the desolate, barren, forgotten mountains of King David, and all of a sudden a Garden of Eden-like oasis is emerging in the desert mountains with the most spectacular views and a house of prayer in the place where prayers were brought into the world. And they see like, that's just a miracle. And what that is, is exactly that. It is a miracle. And what's happening here, we really need to get like, this is what the war in Israel is all about in every way. That's the axis of the war. The entire world history has been spinning around this one idea, this one concept that the nations will know that Hashem is God. On that day, he will be one and his name will be one. How will the nations know? When the promise, the foundational covenant with Abraham, that he promised this land to the, his children, when Israel becomes sovereign in the land given to them, that is the testimony. God chose a particular people. He gave them a particular land. Israel is the only people that can make that claim. Everyone can claim an indigenous rights to a land. I mean, people could just theoretically imagine they find an ancient tribe in Africa and they're actually the Romans that were exiled 
2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, and they walk up to the Vatican and they're like, we were the indigenous people of Rome. We demand Rome back. And the Vatican would be like, what? <laughs> Every land was taken at some point from someone. That's not Israel's claim. It's not that this was our indigenous homeland. This was the land that God gave us as an eternal covenant. And we are here because God gave the land to the people of Israel. And he established his covenant with them through this particular land. And our covenant is to build a society, to build a country that's so beautiful, it is worthy of being the resting place for his presence in the world. So in that way, Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel is the international testimony of the sovereignty of the living God of Israel. Now, what we need to understand is that all of the forces that are aligning up against Israel, it's all a setup. It's all a setup. It's a gift that Israel is about to give the world. As Israel's greatest ally, America, is now turning on her. The odds are being stacked against us. And soon we will be given, we will be up against insurmountable challenges that no reason or logic will be able to explain how Israel will ever be able to overcome all of the challenges. The Hamas and the Hezbollah and Iran and America is now turning on them and they're left alone. Only six million Jews surrounded by over a billion Muslims that want to throw them into the sea. No one's siding with them. They're all alone. Just know evil's primary purpose is to deny the existence of God. If we really understand that evil isn't about killing or murder or the transgender you know, agenda, that's not really what evil is. Evil's raison d'etre is to deny the existence of God. And then that can manifest itself in different sort of political movements, meaning a transgender person, you sort of have to be compassionate for them. They're so confused. But the political engine, the powers behind that movement... Those are anti-God movements, the people that are working to take the land away from Israel. It's all a war against the existence of God, because the ex essential role of evil is to convince the world that there is no right or wrong. There is no good and evil. There is no truth, because there is no God. And that's why Zechariah chapter 8 says, this is what the Lord says. I will return to Zion, and I will dwell in Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth. It is the living testimony of the living God of Israel. Period. Anyone that comes against the Jews in the land of Israel are coming against the living testimony of the living God. That's what this is about. So when you draw a line in the sand, it's very clear. You either stand with the people of Israel that have a God-given right to the land of Israel to be a testimony of the living God of Israel, or you stand against us. And if any war against the people of Israel is a war against the God of Israel, but you know what? God will be revealed whether the enemy likes it or not. In this time in history, the stage is being set. For those that have emunah, it's like exciting. It's kind of like, okay, how is this thing going to unfold? For those that don't have emunah, for those that are just like, I don't know, a lot of instability in the world, get ready because it's going to get rocky. It's going to be a roller coaster of a ride. But if you know that God is the one that's actually driving the bus, you don't need to be the paranoid passenger being like, how are we going to get to the end of our destination? Oh, God is riding the bus. He's the driver. Everything is okay. We are being set up for David against Goliath. We're being set up. For the Maccabees against you know, Alexander the Great. To understand the descendants of Alexander the Great, what a group of priests, you know, there's like a little tribe in Judea, are going to overthrow and beat the Greek Empire? That's a Kiddush Hashem. We're going to sanctify the temple in Jerusalem and the fire is going to go and light up the world? So that's what's about to happen now. And when we realize that that's actually what this war is about. We are the proof text. We are the living testimony. And so when we understand that, we cannot not bring God into this conversation because everything that's happening in Israel, all of it is for that purpose, that God's name will be one and he will be one and the truth will be revealed and people will know, ah, oh, 
There's good, there's bad, there's evil, there's lies. All of the, they're trying to convince you that there's no such thing as a boy and a girl right now. They're actually, that's a war against the truth. That movement that's trying so hard to break our brains and say, there is no truth. Whatever I say is true. Whatever I believe is true. I'm going to form this little idol and I believe that that's God. That's what's happening here. And Israel is coming to shatter all the idols and bring us to a new consciousness where the knowledge of God will cover the world like water covers the sea. 